All right, so you probably get a little pop-up that says we are now recording, so, so everybody knows. Once again, my name is Jamie Bebop, for those of you joining us on YouTube as well. Everyone is muted, your cameras are off, this is a webinar format, so it's gonna be recorded, as I mentioned, for everyone to enjoy later. They're all stored on our YouTube channel. So if you are not following our YouTube channel yet, I highly encourage you to do so because all the past webinars are there. So you can watch them um, as well as a lot of the other stuff that we do. There's a lot of other fun videos on there as well, um, including stuff for kids. So if you have a question during the webinar today, please use the Q&A box. So it lets everybody else see your question and also makes it easier for us to find them all. Um, Eric and I are going to be doing a little bit different format today, a little more interactive uh, back and forth. So um, I will try and throw your questions in there as we go along. So um, for your safety, you should only be able to see what I post in chat, but just in case I missed a setting or somebody manages to get around it, don't click on any links other than what I may post. And on the TCF side of things, um, these webinars are offered free to the public through the Conservation Foundation. We are a nonprofit. Um, and we do encourage you to consider a donation or membership if you are enjoying this series. The more people we have attending, the more it does cost us to run them. So at the end of the webinar, you're going to be taken to a page with a bunch of resources, things you might be interested in, including our virtual tip jar. So if you're enjoying these webinars, I encourage you to donate to help us keep these running. It also can make you a member, so you can enjoy a wide variety of members-only stuff. Um, this webinar series has been going on pretty much since this whole shutdown thing started. Um, so we've been doing two a week and we're going to continue to do so through July. Uh, come August, we're going to start doing them maybe once a week, I think. Uh, it's going to be a little, honestly, a little much for me to handle doing two of these every single week. So um, we're going to be moving them to once a week. Uh, they're probably going to move to Wednesdays. Um, and we're currently testing it out to see if we're going to do them more in the evening as people are going back to work, if that works better, um, or if people still like them during the day. So keep an eye out for those polls. But upcoming webinars this Thursday, I will be, once again, discussing beginning bird watching at home. So what birds you might see at your feeders in your backyard um, and how you can bring more of them. And then Monday on July 20th, we'll be talking about community solar, which is really exciting. Any homeowner, um, actually anyone in the ComEd area can join in and see some savings on your utility bill, as well as uh, take part in encouraging renewable resources. So there you go. That's my housekeeping. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over now to Eric. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so as you said, I'm Eric Anderson. I've worked as an ecologist and forester um, and been doing things with native plants for the better part of 15 years. So uh, enough that I'm still, uh, I, I've learned many of the tricks of my mentors, but I'm still following my mentors because this is a continual learning process. So, um, you know, shout out to those folks and uh, for all of you that are, that are thinking about wanting to grow more natives or you haven't done it or you're, you're you're interested in butterflies and you want to figure out how to grow these plants in your yards and in your gardens. Um, this is, uh, you know, I hope I can give you some, uh, some pointers on that, but you know, most one a really important thing is, you know, finding your local expert, finding the person that you can go to, to ask those, uh, I'll say the silly questions. Okay. Um, and, and when I say that I've asked many of them. And so I'll even share a few of my stories as we, as we go through Jamie, you'll, uh, help to keep me on track, right? So I don't uh, go off into the bushes or into the <laughs> weeds too far. Okay, so, all right. So the first thing we're gonna talk about, when we think about uh, uh, converting lawn into, into wildflowers, one of the things that inevitably comes up is what are the city ordinances on this? If you're living in, uh, especially in a larger city, um, even smaller towns will have ordinances about lawns and keeping it the and the appearances and and how do you make uh, how do you make it so that you're not breaking the laws? Okay, first off, check into those ordinances and see what they say. Um, to 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 not plant something and 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 say, well, I can't do it because of our city ordinances. There are some things that you can do, um, and and this is this is how I've approached it. 
in various places and I think it's worked pretty well. First off, when you're thinking about planting pollinators and planting wildflowers, you're, you're generally we're planting those to support a community. Now we might be thinking of the insect community uh, that we're trying to support, but you're also looking at this as your own community and the community of people. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna kind of flip back and forth through a number of photos that I have. Uh, I tried to limit it down to about 30 or so. So uh, if you get a little motion sickness, I apologize. But, um, but that's, uh, that's what I'm trying to accomplish here. So um, when we talk about your appearance and what, what your Sydney ordinances are, um, this is how I started my one of my current pollinator gardens. First off, I started small. Okay, now this is in Chicago. This is about a mile west of Wrigley Field. So we are in the city, um, mostly single family homes, a few apartment buildings. I live in an apartment building right now, a small six unit building. But uh, this is the, this is where I started. Okay, first notice. Um, I put in, in the plants that we put in, we have all of the tags that came with the plants saying what it is, okay? Um, I made sure, I tried to make sure that when I was putting plants in there, that it's nothing that's going to be too tall. Um, think about where you are relative to corners, and if you've ever been in a place where you're trying to pull out, and I can't see through the tree or through the weeds or through the grass, you know, that's something to, to take into consideration. There happens to be a one-way street just to the left of this photo that's going in and to the left, so I don't have to worry about cars trying to come out uh, from this spot. So, so as, far as, as far as if things got a little bit tall, it shouldn't be too much of a problem, but still, you think about trying to manage it. Now, this is a small plot. This is about five feet by five feet by six feet, um, and it's steadily grown every year by a couple of feet just because I get excited about this stuff and I want to plant a few more things and, and sometimes it spreads. So, um, so putting in what the tags are so that you know that's there, and then also thinking about um, a border, okay? Um, the first, when I first planted this, um, I didn't have any kind of border up. I thought, well, I've got some, some uh, you know some of the the signs in there, and it looks like it's a uh, it's 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 a garden, right? Well, tell that to the lawn company that's been mowing the lawn at this uh, building for the last like five years. They're like, "Yep, it looks like weeds. Let's mow it. It's not grass." And things got mowed off. Well, you know, it happens. I communicated with the company. We got it under control. The landlord's fine with it, and we moved on. And I put a border around it because I said, well, if these guys who are at this place regularly don't realize it, maybe the people walking their dogs also don't realize it. Um, it's amazing how the small foot of a dog will trample and kill a seedling that is just a, a week or two old. Um, so, so I have to think about dog traffic coming through, uh, through our area. All right. Um, also signs. There are a number of signs out there that you can get. I've seen them on the web. Um, I particularly like, um, here's my sign that I have. Okay, with a, now this is a, a program that the, uh, the Conservation Foundation has. It's called Conservation at Home. Um, now, TCF does this in the counties that they are working in, but other organizations or conservation land trusts or, or other conservation groups in around the country can actually subs what, what is the word Jamie is it subscribe to this or they can get a um, become a member yeah. become a member and then they can through their organization offer the kind of certification for a conservation at home um, type of program so so you want to do something to help people encourage conservation um, in, in small places here's a ready-made program that TCF has worked out the kinks over the years. So I, I would love to mow my weeds down, except I've got this sign that says these are supposed to be here. So, um, so that's, uh, you know, that, that's another thing that you can, you can do. Um, there are also signs you can get to say wildflower planting or, 
or restoration in progress. Um, doing just a little bit of searching, you can find, you Monarch know. Monarch Watch. Monarch yep. Watch has yep. one too that you can become a way station and then they've got signs for that as well. I put my email address in the chat. So uh, if anyone is interested in joining the Conservation at Home program and getting your yard certified, drop me an email. Uh, I oversee Will County, but we have people who take care of the other counties within our service area and some franchisee partners outside of there. So um, drop me an email, we'll get you to the right person. Yep, so um, I, I apologize for those people joining from outside of Illinois and specifically outside of Northeastern Illinois. Um, I might be a little bit centric on the, on the Midwest and some of the conditions that we have here. But again, a lot of these things should be able to transfer. It's just some of the organizations that you're working with might be a little bit different. So um, we're all used to working together and working across borders when you get into conversation or conservation because uh, plants and insects, they, they don't understand what borders are. So, um, all right, so appearances, it needs to look nice. You know, if you're gonna put, and also if you're gonna have like an organizational sign up in the yard saying, hey, that's, that's what I'm wanting to do, and you put the sign up and someone from that organization says, all right, well, let me come out and make an initial inspection. They're, they're gonna be thinking about what does it mean to have the sign in your yard? If you have a, in a suburban lawn and you've got, you know, eight foot tall cone, uh, uh, um, eight foot tall cut plant and a lot of other uh, weeds that are growing in with it, you're putting that person uh, into a hard position because you're, you're, again, aesthetics are very important. Aesthetics mean different things to different people. And that's where a lot of those ordinance battles come into place. And if you want your community to be able to adapt and adopt native plant ordinances and wildflower into their, into their lawn ordinances, like you, you gotta, you gotta play, you gotta play along. Okay, at least initially, until more people are familiar and comfortable with it. I feel in the community where I currently am, people see this and they understand what it is. The kids in elementary school around here, they do uh, monarch and milkweed projects. So, so these are familiar concepts. Um, I love nothing more than sitting from my window and seeing people walking by that probably don't care anything about native plants, but then they pause when the swarm of butterflies is, uh, is going around. And to me, that's the beauty in this. It may not be in every single flower, but it's definitely in the life that it brings to my little corner. Okay. Um, all right. So now, how do we start? So are we starting our, 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 our garden, our native plant, our wildflower garden? Are we starting it from seeds or are we starting it from plugs? Um, a lot of different nurseries and different organizations offer seed mixes that you can get. Um, and I have started before with a seed mix because I said, well, I'm, I've got about a thousand square feet that I want to plant and I couldn't afford to buy plugged plants for that whole area. So I bought a seed mix. And with that seed mix, it gives you a, uh, it gives you a, a great, um, you know, list of here's what you need to do with your seed. You need to do what's called stratification. So basically you're, you're mimicking winter. All right. Um, and, and it'll say you need to take this seed, mix it with some sand, stick it in your refrigerator for 30 days or 60 days. And, and then immediately plant it and keep it moist until things start to grow. I said, I can do that. So I was in my then backyard. Um, our house was on four city lots in a small town in Illinois and I hated mowing grass. And I said, I'm converting my yard to prairie because my mom isn't here to tell me I can't do that. Um, when I was 12, that's what I wanted because I hated mowing grass. And uh, now that my yard was much bigger, the last thing I wanted was more yard work. So um, should I rephrase that now in my experiences, different yard work, okay? Um, so I, I, I borrowed the neighbor's rototiller, I tilled it up, I raked away the grass that was there. Um, now this is site preparation. I'm gonna talk a little more about site prep. Um, later on, but but I'll just breeze through it at this in this particular story. So I, I I got rid of all the grass that was there, and I had my area tilled up. I put out the seed just like they said, and then I was out um, 
every morning for the next couple of weeks and I was uh, just putting a little bit of water on it, keeping it moist and, and just waiting and waiting, waiting for something to come. And then it started to happen. I see two leaves break through, something's budding up, it's coming out. And I got excited. I'm like, is this coneflower? Is this, is this, is this blazing star? Am I, I didn't know what I was looking at, but it was coming up. I wonder if that's a little blue stem. Boy, it's exciting. And, 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 and it keeps growing. I, I still can't tell what it is. It doesn't look like anything I'm used to seeing because it's only, you know, it's got two leaves now. And, and well, by the time it got to be to where it was something identifiable, it was about four inches tall. And that's when I realized that I was looking at common ragweed. <sighs> ragweed, right. And then I said, that's a weed. And I started to pull it. Now, what I didn't realize at that point is probably coming up below the ragweed were the little tiny two leaves of the things that I planted. And so not only did I remove my ragweed, but I I think I accidentally uprooted the, 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 the seed mix that I had put in there. So um, that was my first step in, in, uh, in starting a planting wildflowers in my yard. That was my first try. Now I ended up uh, doing some different things. I got it going and it's been a wonderful refuge. I no longer live at the house, although I am in communication with the new owners and they very much appreciate the wildflowers and the butterflies and the bees that come in and, uh, and they've kept it. So, um, um, but it's a learning process. If you, think, if you think that you have to do it perfect and exactly right from the first time around, um, you're not a contractor. Therefore, you're allowed to make a few mistakes. So um, think about it if you're gonna do it with seeds um, that you've got to understand and know what different plants are, okay, when they're small, um, or, um, and, and you have to be able to tend to, tend to those uh, seedlings as they do start coming up. Um, now, the other way to start something new is with plugs. So, on that first garden that I looked at, we had, um, I had started with plugs in this, um, but then also what I've started doing and doing more so is I have collected a number of um, trays where these are either from a plant sale. Uh, most of your conservation organizations um, are going to have an, a, a native plant sale. So um, I know that around uh, the Quad Cities in Illinois um, that there's an organization there that uh, called the, I think it's the Guardians of the Prairie and Forest. Um, they, they have a plant sale. Most conservation land trusts will have a plant sale. Does the Conservation Foundation, they have one? Absolutely. Uh, and they're usually right around Mother's Day. Yeah, Mother's um, Day, spring, around May. That's when you often, early May is when you start seeing those. I know like the Will County Forest Preserve District, the, their friends organization hosts one. We have one. Um, Irons Oaks and Flossmoor has one. If, if you're looking for a land trust near you, there is a website and it's literally just findalandtrust.org and it will, um, and then you can sort by, I think zip code um, to find who your local land trust is. And this is no matter where you're joining us from, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, uh, there are land trusts all over the place. And so you can contact them and find out if they have one as well. Hey, Jamie, that reminds me just a yeah. little bit on what is a land trust, okay? Um, for those of you that may not be uh, aware of it or you've heard of this thing, but you're not really under, un, not really sure, um, the greater uh, movement of land conservation, one of the problems we have is, well, what happens if I sell my property to someone else? Is the new owner going to have the same love and adoration for the natural setting that, that I do? Um, or are they going to purchase this land and then turn it into a subdivision or, or are they going to harvest all the mature trees off of it and, and uh, put it back into agriculture or are they going to take this agriculture land and turn it back in or turn it into, into uh, a city. So what a conservation land trust can do is they can, they, they work with a tool called a conservation easement and they can help protect 
property. And when I say protect it, they put an easement on your land. Similar to like, say when like the power company has an easement to come through a property for their, for their utility lines, they don't own that land, but they do own a few rights of that land. They own the right that says you can't build anything through here and that they have the right with permission to come through on say an annual basis and do maintenance on say like the trees and stuff. So, so conservation easements do the same thing, but they say this land is being protected for certain conservation values. Okay. <clears throat> now every land trust has a different set of, of conservation values that they work to protect. But some examples might be if you're in a, in a scenic area for the, for the, for the, the scenery of the area, for uh, conservation of wildlife, for, uh, for, um, uh, archaeological resources potentially for geologic um, uh, geologic formations um, remnant prairies at least in our part of the world are also a very uh, very important uh, thing that they that they look at also threatened and endangered species are some things Jamie are there other other ones you can no, that, I mean, that basically sums it up. So okay. the farm where our headquarters is has a conservation easement on it. The previous owner decided she wanted her farmland to be protected for the use of agriculture, conservation, and education. And so our headquarters was previously somewhere else. We met with her, helped her to put this easement on there as she was watching all the other farmland around her be turned into subdivisions in Naperville. And we put the easement on the property. And so those 60 acres in the middle of Naperville are now going to remain in protected for conservation, agriculture, and education forever. So there's some tax benefits to doing it, but there are also some uh, qualifications there has to be on, on the property. So it's got to be of a certain size. You know, they're not going to put an easement on a quarter acre lot um things like that but um so every organization is different if you if you if you follow that find a land trust near me um uh then you can find different land trusts and start learning a little more about what their conservation priorities are i know that uh, we had some folks from wisconsin wisconsin has a lot of uh a very local conservation land trusts illinois has i think about 30 uh, operating around the state. Sometimes their territories overlap and sometimes you get, you know, national ones like uh, um, uh, uh, the Nature Conservancy and uh, uh, the, the Conservation Fund. Those are all, those are national uh, wild, wild Turkey Federation and uh, Pheasants Forever. Those are also national um, land trusts. So anyway, that's, Jamie and I are both operating under that larger auspices of of the of the land trust and conservation, and 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 working to make conservation permanent in certain areas. So okay, so all right. So Jamie, be careful about saying phrases because I, <laughs> I go off on tangents. So um, all right. So so what about planting with plugs? Great. So we we talked about finding uh, uh, you know some ways to find how to buy native plants uh, from plugs from like uh, springtime plant sales. Um, well, what about going to my local nursery? I know that if I go to the big box store that they've got, I can buy native columbine there and they've got these beautiful flowers on them that'll bloom all spring long and they have geraniums that'll bloom all spring long. So aren't those, those are native and cone flowers that are native. All right. So is that, are those legitimately native plants? Yes, they are. Um, but what can happen sometimes with those is those are called cultivars of native plants. With a cultivar, they have gone out and, um, and someone has found in nature a, uh, a plant that has just a little bit of a, of a, of a genetic uh, um, mutation and maybe the color of the flower is a little bit different or it's a little bit shorter than the rest of them that are around or, or it has some, some characteristic that maybe it has a larger flower on it that, that the, that the nursery industry says, Hey, we can take this and we can produce it on a scale or mass produce it, you know, and make this work. Or maybe it's from a, a slightly different climate, um, where, where maybe it's coming from say, uh, uh, you know, the, the panhandle of Texas where, where, well, this grows down there, but if we move it up North, it'll, it'll bloom earlier 
uh, in the season and bloom for longer. So um, what happens, not all cultivars are a bad thing, but what can happen is, is insects. Insects and native plants, your local insects, they have evolved together. And so what you get is you have certain bees, okay? Illinois, I think has, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jamie, but something like, like is it around 400 species of native bees. Yep. And, and many of those bees um, are, have, have a very short life span, life, active life cycle, where they may only be above ground and actively flying and pollinating for two to three weeks, where there's a certain wildflower that is in bloom at that time period, and that's why they're coming up. Um, and so, so it's important to have a lot of these native flowers here that are of a local-ish uh, 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 gene pool, so that it, so that it functions in uh, in coordination with the with the insects. So, also what you can get with cultivars is say. Um, a monarch butterfly has a visual spectrum that it follows, that it can see. There are certain colors that, that say to it, that's what I want to eat. Uh, that's where I go for good pollen and good nectar. Well, if you've got, say, a white version of what's normally a purple flower, they may not catch that. And, and so therefore, it may not get pollinated. And that's probably why it didn't fall into the, uh, that's probably why it's, a, it's an outlier and you don't see more of them in nature because, well, that's not what its normal pollinating insect goes toward, okay? Insects can also see colors that we can't see. So even though two flowers may look identical to us, they may be missing a stripe or something in this color that's outside of our visible spectrum. And that color is some kind of signal to that insect sort of, um, I always think of uh, spring beauties. Spring beauties, you can see the little pink stripes on them, but there are also some mm -hmm. um, infrared, ultraviolet, I forget which end of the spectrum they're on, but they're almost like landing strips that say, come here, there's food right here. And so if that plant were to be missing those, even though we couldn't see it, the insects wouldn't know to go there. Yeah, so, and, and also you might get those same plants that they don't have the pollen, as much pollen uh, in them, or maybe their nectar isn't as, as uh, nutritious or something, um, and that's so. There again, I try to shy away from from planting all cultivars into your your garden. Now, if if you already have stuff that's planted and you already have a good established you know stand of coneflowers that you bought from from some other place, by all means, don't don't rip them up. Saying, my God, I these aren't good for butterflies. L look at though when you expand further make sure you're going for, for more local things. Um, I know that in, in Chicago on the north side, there's a, uh, um, there's a, a nursery called the, uh, the Grange, the, uh, the Chicago, I think it's called the Chicago Grange. Um, it's up near um, Western and Peterson. And they have, uh, they get their plants from Possibility Place. Possibility Place is a nursery down in Mooney, Illinois. Um, that grows native plants and trees, and they bring them from from local sources. Their seed is from local; it's locally sourced. Um, I know that other uh, there are a lot of other native nurseries around as well. But here's the kicker that you come up with on native plants: when you go to a store or go to a garden store to purchase plants, what do we often look for? Often, I look for, or people, my mom looks for the colors. What are the flowers on these? Oh, these are pretty. Are these going to fit nicely in my, in my garden? Yes, I think these are great. One of the run problems you run into with native plants is their, their life is primarily underground. They spend a lot of their effort into growing their root system. And for many plants, you've got two years or more of root growth before you're going to get a flower. So by the time you have a plant that is big enough to be flowering while it's in the nursery, it's two years old, three years old, and the economic sense in, in trying to do that is just really difficult. Plus you can't get the quick turnaround of, of we plant them in the spring and they, they're flowering by June. Okay, that's a hard, it's a hard sell. So, so many native plants 
our, our, our native plant nurseries are wholesale nurseries. And, uh, and so you have to be, you have to be willing to, uh, to go with, uh, um, you, know, you have to order in quantities, quantities of say of, of 50 or more usually of each species. So, now, um, the possibility so, place that you mentioned has started doing mail order, and okay. you order in quantities of 18, so, you know, 18 or 36 or whatever, but they can be mixed. The flats can be mixed, so it doesn't have to be 18 coneflower and 18 rudbeckia or something like that. You can do five of this and four of this and three of this and so on, as long as they add up to 18 eventually, but they are also doing mail order, so you can order from them and have them ship it to you. Yep. Um, and, and I think, I think we'll see, we'll see changes in, um, in the native plant nursery system and in some of the garden centers as there's more demand for where are your native plants? What do you have here that's native and local? Where do they come from? If people, when people are asking those questions and the management keeps hearing, well, we have to get native stuff where, where you, you'll, I think we'll start getting to see that change. I think 10 years ago to go into any nursery and even see a cultivar of a native plant was, was next to impossible. So. The um, other big concern with getting things from uh, big box stores is a lot of times those plants have been treated. So they're treated with insecticides or things so that the plants look pretty and are intact and don't have little holes in them because everybody wants you know that perfect apple from the grocery store kind of thing. Um, so we're putting these plants in the ground to benefit the insects, but then they've been drenched with chemicals that are going to kill the insects that are trying to then eat them. So, um, a lot of the more reputable native plant nurseries aren't doing that with the idea that if you're buying native plants, you're going to be aware of the fact that there's going to be holes, there's going to be, um, things like that. So, yep. All right. So, so back into on the, on the target here I have it's been a hobby of mine for the last several years of growing plants from seed so whether it's seed that I have collected in places that I'm allowed to collect or it's seed that I've purchased um, then I know that I have to go through the full stratification process of seeds so so how do I know what I'm trying to plant or how do I make this seed grow? It's not like green beans and tomatoes where you drop the seed in the ground and it'll magically start growing. Um, I did that the first year with some milkweed. I was excited to grow milkweed and none of it grew until the following year. After it sat outside in the failed pots all winter. So you're basically, like I said, you're mocking or you're, you're mimicking winter is what you're doing. Um, I have a um, Prairie Moon Nursery in, uh, it's up in Minnesota. They are, uh, they are a great resource for how to stratify and the cultural guide. Um, I've got this catalog from 2011 <laughs> that I still hang on to and I still, you know, sit at home and, uh, and read this at night. Um, I'm a nerd. Okay, so I, I admit that. Um, but it talks about like different plants, where are they appropriate, where do they work well, um, what are the what are the um, the soil types, the the moisture level, the sun amount, and then how to stratify the seed. So so do I have to do I have to keep it in a refrigerator for for moist for 30 days or 60 days, or do I have to scarify it? Um, those are all we could talk about about germinating seed for another whole hour in a different session. So I'll just kind of keep moving. But that's how I've found that I can grow. You know what, I want to grow some of this. So I'm just going to grow a few of these in a flat and we'll see what grows. If they don't grow, then so be it. So I'm out, you know, $3 worth of seed. Okay. Um, so, so then we have to look at our, okay, site preparation. So let's get into, into site preparation. Um, and I'm going to kind of combine in there our soil, okay? So soils are really important for what you're planting and where you're planting something, um, as is our, how you do your, your preparation, okay? Um, I'm gonna try to flip down to a picture here. I need to let me refresh. Let's see if it's in here. 
Yeah, maybe it's not. Okay. Um, all right. Well, the picture I was going to show you was of a, uh, it's a pollinator. Ah, here it is. Okay. Um, okay. So site preparation on this particular place. This is a pollinator garden that, uh, that we installed at our, uh, at the elementary school where my kids currently go um, here in Chicago. Um, we had a grant from the Illinois Clean Energy Community Foundation to help make this possible. Um, they work within Illinois and they do have a K through 12 pollinator garden program um, that, that they can do with schools. Um, I, before you rush out and say, let's write a grant for the school in my neighborhood, th there are a lot of things you want to have in place first and, and, and you know, not the least being who is our champion who's going to help us through this process. Is the principal on board? Do we have some parents? Is this at all integrated into the education of, of the school or of the kids? Because all of those things have to be in place in order to one, not only get the grant, but also for it to be successful. Because um, again, when you're putting in a prairie, when you're planting wildflowers, you're putting in a pollinator garden, you've got to have uh, you've got to have that buy-in and you're looking at a multi-year process. It's not one and done. Okay, um, so site preparation in this area. Um, this little knee wall, it's about two feet high. It was built um, prior to it being here. There was just a slope that was here that was excellent for playing King of the Hill um, and for playing uh, uh, soccer where you could then just kick the ball up there and it rolled back to you. So it was a great little, little feature there. But as far as growing anything, um, besides some Canada thistles and a few, um, a few, uh, 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 juniper shrubs that somehow survived the kids stomping on them. Um, nothing much was growing there. Um, so when they built up this knee wall, it was in part to put this bench along the edge of the of the playground. So it was a place to, to sit, but also they then, then we thought about what are we gonna grow, have growing in this area, okay? So this is an east face. So we get full sun in the morning and up through, uh, up through midday, by about one o'clock, the sun kind of cuts off uh, and the sh or shadows start forming. And this is in the shade in the afternoon. But this area is in the full sun then for another, you know, until probably five or six o'clock uh, in, the, in the evening. So now this area, because of that slope, we had to put in a lot of topsoil here. Um, and also on top of that topsoil, what you see here, it's just the remnants of we put in, we had 10 cubic yards of compost. So basically a truckload of compost was brought in to this site. Uh, the compost also, it was, um, it had been, um, it was still warm and steamy when it came in. So we knew, or I knew that, okay, it's, it's been heated up, therefore just through the natural biologic process. So I know that any weed seed in there has been killed off and that I shouldn't have to worry about, about it being full of weeds. Okay, so this area got between six inches and a foot of compost in it. Um, not 100% ideal with compost. You generally like to mix it in with what you have, but in this particular situation, um, the budget we were working with, we said, you know what, that's cheaper than topsoil and we know where it came from. Let's just go with it. Um, now in this area over here where we didn't have to raise the grade any, we put on about a two inch layer and then we mixed it in with the existing uh, with the existing soil that was there. Now we had also gone on site preparation here. We use uh, herbicide, so uh, a glyphosate or a Roundup, to to spray off and to kill the weeds that were growing in in this area. Um, starting in the summer before, so starting in like July August, we started to 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 do the site preparation, and then once we killed it off once, we let it let it sit, let it regrow. Came back a month later and we did herbiciding again. Um, when, you're, when, you're using, when you're using any kind of herbicide, you really have to follow the, the labeled manufacturer specifications for how, you're, uh, for how you're spraying and what you're trying to kill. Um, some people think, oh, I'll just add a little bit more. It'll do fine because if a little is good, a lot might be better. Well, what can happen with some herbicides is if you increase the amount that you're spraying, not only does one, it becomes, you know, more hazardous to, to the environment, um, but, but two, you can actually do what's called um, a chemically mowing 
the, 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 the area. So essentially, you, you, because the concentration of the herbicide is so high, you, um, you, you not only, you, you get an immediate kill of everything and you come back in two days and everything is just dying or, or already turning brown. Well, maybe that's fine for, for young seedlings, but for well-established plants with roots, you didn't give the plant time to bring all of that uh, herbicide down into the roots and to, to fully kill the plant. Instead, you now have just essentially mowed it um, and you think it's dead. And then you say, all right, let's start planting. And then you find out that you've got your, you've still got weeds growing in there. So we did that over um, in a smaller section. So if you were growing a, in a smaller garden, if you were going to do like a five foot by five foot, you can put down like black plastic over that, or, uh, or you can put down other, other dark, uh, dark fabrics or plastics over something. Jamie, what are some things that you've used um, in, um, in, that, in the small situation for, for killing off? Yeah, that's basically it. You know, that black plastic, putting the black plastic down on top of it um, as sort of a solar sterilization, you might call it, um, that, that works. Um, landscape fabric is okay. I personally hate landscape fabric just because I've had to deal with so much of it trying to get it up later. Um, I, I just, I really hate the stuff. Um, uh, cardboard is another one that you can do. Um, you can, um, or, you know, lasagna gardening is another term that you might look up, um, which has to do with layering of cardboard or newspaper and compost and mulch and soil and you kind of layer all of these things together and that helps to keep the weeds down as well as helping to build up the bulk of your soil as well. Um, so we've been doing a pretty good job I think of answering questions as they've been coming up um, but just real quick to uh, Joellen had a question of are herbicides safe what can you use instead that's effective? Um, okay so this is where I often will talk about integrated pest management. Okay. So, and this is another reason why I say starting small is a good idea. Okay. So integrated pest management is when, or IPM is where you look at what are the biological controls, mechanical controls, and then chemical controls for, for your, the vectors that you're dealing with. Okay. So I will often, move to uh, look at first mechanical control. So are these weeds that you can pull? Maybe you're converting uh, an existing garden to, uh, into, your, uh, into being your, your wildflower uh, garden or wildflower bed. Okay, there's a situation where, you know what, I can pull out or I can dig out the, say the hostas that are there or the other, other plants that are there or the weeds that are there. I can pull them out by hand and, and do, do all right there. Okay, sometimes it's a, 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 the, uh, um, a, a biological method might be, um, well, less in this situation, but uh, goats, okay? Uh, <laughs> those of us that have dealt with uh, large-scale restoration projects, often we deal, at least in the Midwest, with invasive shrubs, and goats will just eat the heck out of those. Um, and poison ivy. And poison ivy, yeah. Yeah, they're great. They're just like, they're, they're just nature's recycling center. Um, they're, they're, they're wonderful until they stand on your car. Um, so, um, or eat the wrong bushes, right? Um, so, so, so biological controls, another biological control would be shading. Okay. So when we talked a little bit about, uh, using the, you know, putting, putting matting down or something over the top, that is, uh, uh, that's, that's good. What the, what the black plastic does, not only does it shade it out, but it also heats things up. So we talk about the compost and I talked about compost. And when I saw that it was steamy, whenever it came in, you know, it's still a hundred degrees inside, you know, the, the compost as we were, as we were putting it on there. Okay. That heat, getting it up to 120 degrees and holding at that temperature for a while is a good chance you're going to kill most of the weed seed that's in there. So one of the things with site preparation, not only are you trying to, to, kill the existing vegetation, but in most sites, remember that story I had about the ragweed coming up? Well, all of that ragweed seed, although I didn't have ragweed growing in that place, all of that seed was sitting just, you know, you know, maybe a quarter inch or a half an inch under the surface, waiting for the last 50 years to get up to the surface so that it had a chance to, 
be allowed to grow. And whenever I turn the soil over, that introduced it. So if you have a place where you are looking at turning over the soil, it'd be good to turn it over early, let it regrow, kill everything out again, whether you're doing it by hand or whether you're doing it by herbicide, and, and to really get those, to get that seed bank, it's called, to get that to germinate and grow so that you don't have to deal with it once you've put in the things that you want, okay? So also an important thing with site preparation is you're figuring out what is the soil you're dealing with. Now, if you're in an urban area, which is where if we're talking about putting in small scale wildflower gardens um, or pollinator gardens, you're, you're uh, going to the USDA soil maps may not be very helpful because chances are that street got dug up or when that building was constructed, all of the leftover construction debris is sitting one inch below the surface. I can't tell you the number of pieces of asphalt that we found um, coming out of this, uh, uh, in, in this particular project, um, or, the, um, or the amount of, uh, uh, <clears throat> amount of other uh, uh, debris that we found just under the surface. Also, incredibly sandy. Okay, in Chicago, our soils tend to be, um, as, you're, as you're getting closer to Lake Michigan, you're either in sand or you're in heavy clay. Um, there are some, uh, some glacial moraines in, uh, in, in other parts of the city as you go out further away from Lake Michigan, or once you get up on those moraines, you do get a better quality loamy soil, but it still has a lot of, you can have a lot of rocks and stuff in it, but it's still, it's much better soil. But when you're where we are, which is former lake bed, um, you, you get a lot of sand or you get a lot of soil and it can change block to block, uh, street to street. So this area happened. Suburbs. Yeah, you get to the suburbs. Heavy clay. Yeah, or if you're in a, a new-ish subdivision, um, I say new within the last, say, 20 or 30 years, chances are all of the topsoil in that subdivision, in that area, was scraped off, put onto a side next to the highway, and sold off as topsoil so that when they were putting in the new roads and all the infrastructure, they had nice compactable soil that they could work with. Um, and then they came back and put on six inches of whatever was left at the end and said, there's six inches of topsoil, there you go. So I know a lot of folks have found they, they dug into their yard and, and to, 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 to grow a vegetable garden this spring when they couldn't do anything else. And they realized that, that they, their soil quality was just, was just garbage because it's, it's basically subsoil, just down a few inches. So um, kind of moving along on the topic of site prep then, um, Dan says they want to cultivate part of a large easement that's on their property is native prairie. It's currently typical lawn grass. So they want to know what they have to do to till up or kill in order to change it over to prairie. They want okay. to eventually have a mix of grass and flowers over some larger areas. Sure. Um, one, of the, one of the sites I've, that I've worked with recently um, when I was working with uh, Cardno, um, uh, Cardno Inc. Uh, they uh, operate around the Midwest. Um, we had big, uh, probably about five acres of a grassy area, where we did a using herbicide. Now, if you if you don't have a license for for operating or for using herbicide, you should look at uh, working with someone that does um, and understands this process. Uh, this is where you know contractors. There are a number of folks that do work with natives that can help you with this. Um, um, but also making sure that they understand what the goals for working are. Um, I have found uh, the, the best results we had, well, two sites I'll talk about. One was, was a, uh, a brownfield um, that, uh, that was kind of steep slopes and it had four acres of grass that was basically on clay that had been brought into the site um, about two years earlier. So it was managed as mowed, mowed lawn, um, with low quality grass and probably a lot of weeds, but as long as you keep it low, it all looks like lawn, right? Um, and then another site that had been mowed lawn grass that was kind of a wet area for a long time, but never really utilized by the community there. So they were converting both of those sites to, uh, um, to, 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 to wildflowers and to prairie. Um, 
using just Roundup at the first site that was the that was the brownfield cleanup site um, had a lot of problems with uh, the next round of weeds popping back up. So they end up they turned over the soil as they were doing their site preparation, and we just had a lot more weeds that came up. Um, in fact, there were Canada thistles and sweet clover throughout, and so it was just a real a real management uh, mess to work with. Now the other site that was grass, but it was you know tended to just kind of kind of get wet. Um, that area, we we did an application of um, uh, it's called plateau, and um, with with a with a small amount and there's a there's a mixing amount of uh, of, uh, of glyphosate in there. So what that did, the plateau provided a um, uh, and that's a brand name as well. I think I'm not sure if it's Dow or Dupont that makes it, but uh, but what that does is that that particular herbicide has what's called residual to it. So when you when you apply it, it not only works immediately to do the killing or to, to, to kill off what vegetation is there, but it has residual to kind of stick around for for up to a couple of months. So if it's a place where you were going to be planting your vegetable garden, you know, next week, not the option you want to use. But if it's the place you're looking at doing some planting in the fall, say like seed planting, um, it's a great option. And then if uh, you know, in, in that scenario, if you've got access to a, a no-till seed drill, um, that's where, um, you know, I would, I would just till right into, you know, once you, once, if you can, once you've done the herbicide treatment, if it's still a lot of thick grassy thatch layer to it, look at prescribed burning off the grass. So then you've got exposed, basically exposed uh, bare soil, and then looking at using a seed drill, um, a no-till seed drill, a native plant seed drill, and being able to drill right right into that without turning the soil over. Okay, um, that's I, I've found that sometimes when you turn the soil over, you you run into um, you run into who knows what kind of weed mess that's there. Um, you know, with any place like that, depending on what your time frame is, you know, you might look at well, let's look at a small section of this place. What happens when we till it up a little bit? What pops up? And if what pops up is you know, reed canary grass, um, you know, ragweed, sweet clover, and Canada thistles, then that might give you a sign of where the rest of it might go or what's growing around there. You know, if you've got a real area, an area of a, you know, significant impact of, uh, of weeds, that's uh, a weed seed coming in. You know, anytime you open up the soil and you till the soil, you're inviting every seed that's floating through the air to come in. So good or bad. Does that answer your question there, Jamie? Yeah, I think so. So okay. basically for that, you need to prep the site, get rid of the grass either through, depending on the size of the site, chemical yeah. means, mechanical means. Yep. Um, and then in, a, in, a, in the case of a large area, you probably want to do a mix of seed and a few plugs. The plugs will give you a little bit of color and growth right away. And then the seeds will help to fill in everything as time goes on. Yep. Yep. So, so, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I've got a couple more things here. I, my time says we're getting short on time. Um, so Jamie, you let me know if I need to cut it off, but, uh, uh, okay. I'm going to talk about mulch. I'm going to talk about species selection. Okay. Um, the part that everybody probably wants to cares more about is, well, what flowers do I put in? Okay. Uh, mulch. Um, I have a, a love-hate relationship with mulch, uh, a love relationship in that it makes my life easier, okay? Um, when I put down mulch, I can see where the plugs that I put in, where they are growing, especially when they're young and when they're small. Um, I can also see um, what is, uh, <clears throat> I can see what, uh, um, um, what else is growing? So in this particular site here, this is again that same uh, elementary school garden. Um, the kids are out helping. They can see the place so they can put their foot if there's mulch there. If you have little tiny seedlings, it's really hard to see. Um, if you're just stepping on the ground, am I stepping on a seedling or am I stepping on 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 the ground? Um, so in this particular case, they can they've got something they can see. Mulch is great for keeping down weeds because you're, again, you're shading the ground just like you would with that ground tarp, okay? Now the downfall of mulch is 
80% of our native bees in, uh, in Illinois are ground nesting bees. That means they need access to open and exposed soil. So um, what I do then in as a hybridizing model here is, is I need to be able to control the weeds in a new planting. And so I will use mulch on it for the first one or two, maybe three, for the first two, two to three years as plants are getting established. And then once they're really established and I feel like I've got kind of the weed seed bank out, um, I will stop applying mulch. And then as exposed soil comes up, as I'm doing weeding or planting something new, it's usually pretty easy to control weeds in that area. Um, also because the native plants are bigger and they're shading stuff out. So it's a lot easier to have that exposed soil. I don't feel the need to have, you know, thick mulch throughout the place. Um, if mulch helps you keep the aesthetics up, you know, go around the edges, but you maybe don't have to go all the way back into the interior part of it. You know, just leaving some area exposed to soil is going to help those bees out uh, quite a bit. Okay. Um, so going now, looking at any other questions on mulch or thoughts on mulch there? Um, no, a couple more on herbicides, but we can come back to those. Okay, okay. Um, let's talk about species selection, okay? Um, when, when thinking about what, what to plant, you have to take into consideration, I mentioned before, what are your soil types, okay? Do you have sandy soil? Do you have heavy clay soil? Um, do you have gravel? Are you growing in, uh, in, uh, you know, in one of the mountain states? Do you have a, a very little topsoil and a whole lot of, uh, you know, gravelly, gravel areas, okay? Um, the, the easiest way to think about your soil types is, is and, and to understand what your soil types might be is if you have a nearby preserve that might have a, in Illinois, we have what are called nature preserves. And when something is called a nature preserve, it's usually because it has, it's a remnant of, of, uh, of ecosystem, of pre-settlement conditions. And I can see what's growing in some of those sites and recognize that, okay, if these soils are similar to what's nearby here, then maybe some of these are the plants that'll do well at my site, okay? But not only do you have your soil type, uh, but you also have your, your, your moisture level. So is this in a wet place? Is this in a dry place? Um, um, and this, uh, you're, you're in, in the two pictures that you're seeing right now, we actually, we essentially have two different types of soil here. This is at the same el elementary school. This shot right here is around the corner down here of that area we were looking at before. So this area is very sandy. This is where we mixed in that, you know, two inches of compost and we just mixed it in with the topsoil. Um, and this area here is, um, is, has that, uh, you know, six or eight inches of compost on top. Um, this gets some rain runoff from the upper parts, from the upper part of the building, and also from a sidewalk area that's just to the right of the photo. So it's fairly moist, and the soil tends to hold moisture really well. So, and just showing you what differences in soil type are, we have in these two areas planted similar species. Um, these two pictures are taken at the same time. You can see what the penstemon is doing here in, uh, in mid-June, it's taken off and doing very well, um, versus in here, the pinstamons are still pretty darn small and still just getting established because of the quality of the soil. So if you've got, you know, beautiful uh, Iowa glacial till soil, um, you're probably going to be able to do more things than, uh, uh, and have quicker results than if you have a lower quality soil that don't have the, have as much nutrients. But if you do have sandy soils that are in full sun, there are things that you can do there, things that you can grow that don't do as well in heavy soils. Maybe it's because they, they, uh, they're used to growing in places where they have shorter species around. So, so there, there are just many things that you can do, many species you can look at that are different, okay? Um, so your, your, your moisture, your soil, and how much sun do you get? Okay, there are a lot of plants. If we're planting and looking at planting in yards and looking at planting around homes, are you getting eight hours of sunlight in a, in a place? If you're getting more than eight hours, then I think you can safely say that that's a full sun site. If you're getting less than eight hours, I'd call it partial sun. If you're getting one or two hours, that's going to be a, a shady spot. Okay, so um, 
and so, check your sites too. You know, really go out and look at them at different times a day. Um, this berm that I'm talking about planting that I've been working on, it for the longest time it was very sunny. And so I have in my head that it's a sunny spot. Well, we put a couple of trees in it and those trees have gotten a little bit bigger over the years. And so this last time around, I bought a bunch of sun loving plants and put them in. And as I'm planting them, I'm like, this is kind of comfortable. This is kind of nice, and nice and shady. And I went, oh no, those trees have grown up to the point where now my full sun berm is now partial sun, partial shade. So, um, don't assume you know exactly what your site looks like. Make sure you look at it different times of day and different times of the year too. Yep, exactly. So, um, so if we're looking at, you know, in shady places, you know, here's a, here's one little spot that I have. This is a wild ginger. Um, wild ginger is a great ground cover. It's one of my favorites um, that grows in, in woodland sites. Um, and and also will grow in shade. I planted it in this place specifically. This is under a magnolia tree, um, but the uh, the roots of the tree are kind of sticking up here, and you can see where the lawnmowers have gotten over it. So I'm like, okay, let's keep the lawnmowers away from the tree, um, and and let's get something else growing in here that'll look nice, and uh, and it's and it doesn't require a lot of uh, a lot of help. In the summertime, it gets kind of dry in this area. So it can handle that. If it's also, if it's a little moist, it also can handle that too. Um, and it's doing, doing really well. This is, uh, I think I started with two plants here and this is on about the either second or third year of it. So it, it kind of slowly grows and creeps um, as you let it. That's wild ginger. Um, another area of, of, of shady spots that I have here. Um, okay, here's another, another spot here, uh, columbine. Um, is this one. So there's a native columbine. That's another one where you got to be careful because the cultivars, if you want to, um, if you want to know if something is a cultivar, it'll generally, if you look down in the fine print on the tag, it'll say, you know, uh, aqu aquiligia, um, you know, canadensis, and then it'll say something like, uh, like uh, in, in parentheses, uh, prairie fire. Okay, well, if it's got one other name to it like that, that's in parentheses, that's a good chance that you're looking at a cultivar of something, okay? Um, now, nice thing about about uh, uh, columbine is it, it can grow in the shade, it can grow in the sun, um, it can grow in sand, it can grow in heavier soils. Um, once once the, like at this time of the year now, by July, it's done with its uh, flowering, the seeds have already matured. You can actually go in and you can clip off those seed stalks that are there and it'll just continue to fill out in kind of a bushy, low growing form. So although it won't have flowers, it will have um, um, really nice, uh, a nice green area in places that otherwise stuff may not be able to grow, okay? Um, I've also seen columbine growing in the crack of rocks, okay? The places where, where like how can anything grow here and there's a columbine, you know, that somehow found a way to stick its roots in it and, and grow. They've also got really, deep roots to them, um, a really, really hardy root system. Um, in the in the foreground here, we've got wild geraniums. Again, another, you know, woodland st uh, staple for for uh, uh, for wildflowers. They uh, they bloom nicely. I like these in our area around Mother's Day in early May is when these are in full bloom. And so they just they just look look really nice. Uh, and uh, um, and will kind of bloom consistently for uh, for uh, for at least two to three weeks. Um, there's one other spot I think I have um, a photo of it here. Uh, okay, here's another one. So early season plants. Okay, when you're planting um, when you're planting your wildflowers, you need to think about if you if pollinators are one of your goals, you really need to think about having plants that are going to be blooming throughout the season. So how do you get things that are blooming as early as say April and May, also into June and July when we get our, you know, more common species blooming, but also further later into the fall. So you want to look at your bloom times of the plants that you're putting in. Okay. Um, um, so, so this is one, this is a GM uh, uh, prairie smoke, it's called. These aren't quite in bloom, um, but when they do bloom out, it'll just look like a tuft of like fuzz fuzzy hairs coming out. It's uh, like cotton candy. 
Yeah, yeah, like cotton candy. It's really, uh, or like the you know the little troll dolls that they uh, used to used to see. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. kind of what the the yeah. tops of these look like. Yeah. And uh, and these are up. Um, you know, I not a hundred percent sure when this photo was taken, but this is probably in like May. Um, so you're Ooh, getting something. Coming. Yeah, they're you know a couple weeks ago, I think. Week oh really? Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and they'll they'll and yeah, I've seen I have some that have bloomed earlier and some that bloom later. Um, you know, they, they may not be following their, uh, the clock that they're supposed to follow. So, um, so that's there. And then, um, okay. Um, also if your area where you're going to be planting, if you, if you've seen moss growing there, there's a good chance that you've got enough shade to grow shade tolerant things. Okay. So ferns, there are many varieties of ferns, um, generally can do well in those situations. Uh, some will require a little more moisture than others, but, uh, but, but, you know, ferns are a great thing. Um, and they go with the, the thought in native plants as a uh, texture. So having good texture in a, in a, in a spot. Um, so, uh, what also, what's the traffic coming through your area as you're looking at planting? Okay. This is, uh, when at our elementary school, before we put in the bigger pollinator garden project, we said, let's start something small that we can kind of work out some kinks here first. So myself and a couple of teachers, we said, let's do this. And so I just uh, dug some things up in my place at my, in my, in my own little gardens and, and transplant them here. Uh, started some, some very common things from seed. You can see the common milkweed uh, growing along this area. There's also a little bit of penstemon um, and there's some uh, gray coneflower, I think, and some, uh, uh, Mandarda or bee balm. Okay, those are all very common species that are all pretty aggressive, but this is also next to the sidewalk and on the other side of that fence there is the school playground. So you're talking high traffic area and what I had noticed in taking my kids to school for, for a couple of years that that this little section, this little six inch area of openness was the only place where any weeds could grow that the kids didn't stomp them down. And so we said, all right, let's put in some aggressive plants in these places. At another section on the same fence, there is a stand of cup plant. So prairie cup plant is, uh, it's uh, one of the silphium uh, plants, uh, the same as your, it's in the same family as your, as your prairie dock, your compass plant and your rosin weed. Um, it is one, a species I do not recommend planting if you're doing a small native garden because it needs space. It's, uh, it can get very aggressive, it create, produces a lot of seed, uh, but more importantly, it produces a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of shade below it. So when you have a, a seven foot tall plant that, uh, that casts a lot of shade around it, it's hard for anything else to get, a, uh, to get a foothold. Same goes with your common milkweed, all right? Um, common milkweed, we love it. If you're gonna plant it, put it in a place with the same idea as where do you put your mint that you're growing? If anyone has ever planted mint and said, oh, I love mint, I'm gonna put a plant here. And then two years later, you're wondering, why did I plant that? It's gone everywhere, it's taking over. There's a reason it's called milkweed. Um, and I think that's because of, it has a rhizominous root, meaning it'll, it'll uh, the main plant has a root that's you know, 12 inches or so underground, that's a runner, it's running out. And, uh, and from your first, your main plant, it will, um, it'll, it'll send out lots of little tendrils growing in every direction. The, and, and, and it will spread this, what we're looking at here. Um, I think originally I planted uh, one here and one here. And I think all of these growing this direction are coming off of this one plant going here. So now, um, talk for a second, if you would, um, mm -hmm. about transplanting milkweed, because I get that question a lot of people wanting to transplant milkweed. And what I have always been told and my own personal experience, I've never had good luck with it. And you told me why. Okay, so two reasons. One, if you wanted to transplant common milkweed, I think people will often say, all right, well, I will dig it up. And so they dug it up and you're like, I have a 12 inch, 12 inch root right there. And I've got the root of it and I'm gonna transplant it. Well, 
if you only have this 12 inch part here, what you really need is to get to this horizontal root that's growing out here, that's below that, okay? So one, getting enough of that root. Two, when are you transplanting it? If you're transplanting it when it's dormant or in that early spring before you have a really big and established top, you're gonna to have more success in being able to transplant it that way. Now, there are other types of milkweed um, that don't transplant as well. Um, now this one's not blooming right now, this particular photo, but this is butterfly milkweed, which uh, only, get, only gets to be about two, two and a half feet tall. And uh, it has bright orange blooms right now in, uh, in Northern Illinois. It's, uh, it's blooming like mad, it's beautiful. Um, I see it growing in sandy areas. I see it growing in, uh, in, 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 in heavier, loamier soils. Um, it's doing great. It, uh, it's not a wetland plant, um, but it can do, it can grow in a lot of conditions. It just needs full sun. Um, the places where I see it growing in partial sun, it's, uh, it doesn't look as, as filled out and as full. You can see this plant has what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, eight or nine different stalks coming off of it. <coughs> it's, it's happy and doing well, all right? This is a very difficult plant to dig up and transplant. One, because usually when people think about transplanting a plant, it's when it has flowers on it. Anytime a plant is blooming, you are looking at the exact wrong time to transplant it, okay? Um, so one. Number two, if you are going to try and transplant something like this, uh, you know, think twice about it. Think, can you gather seeds from it and grow the seeds and transplant the seed and move the seeds? Because you're going to have, a, there's a higher chance of probability of it surviving if you're doing that. Um, um, because it just, it just doesn't work well. It kills me. I've seen it in a number of places, a number of the uh, nature, uh, natural areas in parks around Chicago that people have gone in with a shovel and left the divots of, well, I took a big chunk of soil with me. Um, and, and they, they dug out the, the, uh, um, the butterfly milkweed. I, I, I don't understand. It, it's, it's not going to grow well. Um, it's going to be shocked. It's, uh, you know, also all the reasons I don't, I don't love bald and burlap trees. That's a topic for another day. We won't go there. But you know, when you're, when you're these, a lot of these native plants are putting down significant roots going down several feet deep. So if you, when you cut that off, especially during the growing season, when they have a big top that's full of green and really needing the nutrients and the moisture that those roots are providing, you cut that off, it's not going to do well. Okay. Um, Plants like swamp milkweed, same kind of thing. Um, if you're if you're gonna try and transplant it from someplace, wait till it's going dormant, um, or do it early in the season before it's really taken off and has much growing done for it. Does that answer your question, there, Jamie? Yes, it okay. does. And so we are, as you noticed, running out of time here. Um, we, if we could, we I've got two questions sitting here. Um, if we could answer those and then maybe we'll do a little summary and we can wrap it up. Great. All right. So um, Joellen wanted to know about cocoa mulch. Feelings on cocoa mulch. Um, I have no opinion. Um, if, uh, I mean, cocoa like the, or like coconut, coconut. Uh... I believe so. I, I know I've heard of it. And I want to say I've I've heard recommendations against it, but I can't say exactly why. Okay. I, I am not I, I'm I'm I am not familiar with it. Um, I I I from what the nurserymen that I have talked to, you want to stick with hardwood mulch. You want to go like a double ground hardwood mulch is the best way to go with that because I want to say that cocoa mulch had some kind of um, naturally occurring chemical in it that could be toxic to plants. Okay. Yeah. I know that, I know that you have to be careful about, uh, you know, getting allelopathic uh, stuff in plants in some places that are, that are, that are processing and producing mulch 
um, I know that they'll be concerned about bringing in walnut trees, okay? Another right. consideration, if you're looking to plant beneath walnut trees, um, they do produce the, 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 the shells of the, or the, the husk of the walnuts and the, and the leaves. It'll produce a chemical, the, the juglone, uh, juglonic acid, which, is, uh, which prevent a lot of plants from growing underneath it. So, so check for walnut toxicity. Um, that's something to search. And a few, a few people have commented that um, cocoa is poisonous to dogs, the cocoa mulch. Is, it's okay. Easy. Dogs can get sick. So there you go. Uh, thank you for helping us out there. Great. Um, and then Charmaine says, thinking that herbicides can kill insects, how long do you have to wait to ensure whatever you plant there eventually will not kill future beneficial insects? Um, the, so, so. We're, we, we generally are speaking of herbicides versus insecticides. Mm -hmm. And what Jamie had mentioned before, and those of you in the world of beekeeping, uh, you know, keeping European bees, keeping honeybees, um, you know, we've heard of uh, nicotinoids or neonicotinoids. Um, and those are, those are actually, it's, it's, a, it's a neuro uh, chemical that basically is used to treat seeds to prevent uh, insects or grubs from eating the seed as it's in the ground, okay? Um, um, the stuff that I'm talking about applying isn't, isn't that nature of a, of a chemical. Um, and again, by following the, the, the manufactured uses of that chemical or of that herbicide, um, herbicides meaning it kills plants, you know, then you shouldn't run into those problems. Right, and so there, there is a difference between herbicide and insecticide. One, what it, what's intended to kill plants works on certain special pathways in plants, doesn't affect insects. So kind of, I think that's kind of a misconception that if it's, if it's intended to kill something, it's gonna kill everything. And that's not always the case. Some of them are, are a little more specialized to only target insects that said, the insecticides don't target specific insects, not like we have insecticides that only kill the bad ones and don't hurt the good ones. If it kills insects, it's gonna kill all the insects. So whether it's organic or a commercial, traditional type of insecticide or not, if it's intended to kill, it's going to kill. Yep. Um, so, so also, um... In like in this uh, this pollinator garden with the elementary school, um, we used we used uh, herbicide only at the very beginning when we were doing the site preparation, and and since then, um, throughout this entire growing season, there hasn't been any herbicide used on it, right. which is why we stuck with using mulch, and also we stuck with with um, I have spent a lot of my time out there um, as a as a volunteer. Um, doing weeding at the site primarily because I know what is uh, we also threw some seed out here I know what a native plant looks like versus the uh, the weeds that are coming up and so I've been I'm the quote-unquote local expert that is uh, helping in this project so thank you so so much Eric to kind of summarize here we've got you want to first know your site. You want to know your moisture conditions. You want to know your soil type. You want to know your sun conditions. So you're putting the right plants in to help ensure success in the long run. Then you want to prep your site, kill off the grass. I've, I've had so many people ask me, well, can't I just plant stuff in grass and let it take over? The grass will outcompete it almost every time. So you really need to remove the grass remove the weeds and things that are there either through mechanical means, through shading it with plastic, things like that, or through chemical means, proper application of herbicides. And that's the thing, one of the things that we look at with the conservation at home certification, we don't say you can't use any chemicals ever. It's judicious use of the right chemicals at the right times and, yep. and not overusing them. So. Yep. Um, so proper preparation of your site then to remove the grass first and then figuring out the right plants to put in at the right time. 
So as people close out of the window of this webinar, you're gonna see our conservation at home site, as I mentioned, and on that site, you're gonna see the Bringing Nature Home brochure. I call it the yellow brochure that we have. And that is our native plant Bible. So it's a huge list, by no means completely comprehensive, but it is a very large list of native plants, their growing conditions, preferred light moisture conditions, um, so please feel free to download that, check it out, email me with any questions. Um, I will put my email once again in the chat so that if anybody has any questions, you can contact me and um, either I or Eric or someone um, would be happy to get back to you. Okay, there we go. So we are, my, my email is in the chat, so. Um, one one last little last little thing to mention. Don't forget the native grasses. Yes. When you're when you're when you're a, a healthy prairie, a healthy wildflower section also has grasses in it and sedges. Those offer a great amount of support for a lot of these plants. Native plants grew have grown in tight clusters, not spaced out twelve or six or twelve inches. They're used to growing in tight clusters where they have other plants that are supporting them. Um, so there are some great things you can do if you've got the grasses in there to help keep some of the taller things from just flopping over. All right. So once again, thank you so much, everybody. Have a great rest of your week. We hope to see you back again on Thursday for beginner bird watching. And thank you, Eric, for all the knowledge that you dropped for us. Not a problem, Jamie, anytime. All right. Thank you so much, everybody, and stay safe. We will see you all again very soon. Take care.